This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Sixth Man Show. Today is July 25th, 2022. Jonathan Osborne here, as always, oh. joined by the co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, what's up? You got a little pep in your step. You got your 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 energized tonight. I think it's because... You know, we were just roasting Kevin a minute ago. We were having some fun <laughs> before we started to record. It's just, you know, it's a good day to be with the Sixth Man Show. We have fun. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. We we got a, a great episode, which you're going to talk about, obviously, here in just a second. But did want to just kind of iterate that, was that that, that we had a great time with our guest today. You guys are yes. reading this. You know who our guest is, but he provided a lot of great insight. So really, I, that's why I'm doing good. We're recording this after, so letting you in on some post-production, post-recording magic. We're, we're recording this after the show, but it was a great time, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. So I feel like we like legitimately have good chemistry with every guest that we bring on. You know, I feel like mm. we always have a good time. But today's guest, so Stephen Kagan, if you guys follow him on Twitter, you know him better as NBA University. He also writes for OrlandoMagicDaily.com. We just had a really good time with him. He's super knowledgeable about the team, about the NBA, kind of about the analytical slant of the game, and just provided a lot of info, a lot of insight. It was a ton of fun, and we learned a lot, I think. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Always fun to break down analytics. We talk a lot about it. We were able to ask genuine questions. I was begging and pleading for information on players or analytically that, that would provide me just more reassurance uh, of my love for them and the impact on the team. So, And you know, we kind of let him know what we were looking to do with the episode ahead of time, so I think he mm-hmm. did prepare a little bit, but we were also throwing some curveballs at him and you Mm -hmm. can always tell who really knows what they're talking about because he like didn't even have to like oh wait a second let me look this up he was just like off the rip freestyling really really impressive we had a great conversation so just thanks again to steven for for joining the show uh we want to make that a regular thing you know throughout the regular season and and so on and so forth so just thanks again to to steven for joining the show um just some kind of like in-house news we're really getting close to really ramping things up here and like taking things to the next level just in terms of like our video content again across all of our social media platforms yep. and we are so excited to bring that to you guys mm-hmm. so um just be on the lookout for that that is coming sooner than you think uh, we also want to shout out our patrons specifically our hall of fame tier patrons so if you guys did not hear you've been living underneath a rock or just not listening to the show uh, but we started a patreon a while back to help financially support the show so if you'd like to partner with us in that endeavor you can find us at patreon.com slash the sixth man show we have three separate tiers all pretty affordable with different levels of benefits uh, if you guys want to talk to us throughout the day on discord uh, our hall of fame and our all-star tier both have uh, that uh, benefit built into them so if you guys want to chat with us throughout the day you can definitely do that Uh, and then we shout out our hall of fame tier patrons on every single episode which we're going to do now short uh shout out court cousins armin elite too low jonathan borges magic player history wiffle ryan saying the distract pierre a dylan holden mr mikey lil penny drum danimal dutto 15 bobby skinner nate donnelly Gotti 93 thank you guys so much for the support and then if you haven't heard there's just a couple weeks left to vote for us for the orlandoweekly.com best of orlando 2022 ballot if you guys want to vote us for best local podcast you can go to vote.orlandoweekly.com Find us under Local Notables and then vote for us, The Six Man Show, for Best Local Podcast. Helps out the show a ton. Uh, I think that's been enough of us goofing around. We are going to get you guys right into the interview with Stephen Kagan. Hey, guys. Producer Kevin here. And whether you're watching us on YouTube or you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, we want you to stop whatever you're doing right now and subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribing on YouTube helps the show a ton and it's completely free. All it takes is one click of your mouse or one tap of your finger if you're watching on your phone. We know that a lot of you watch us all the time but aren't subscribed. So please do the show a favor. Subscribe to us on YouTube. It would help the show out a lot. Without any further ado, let's get into our interview with Stephen. 
All right, Magic fans, we are joined by Stephen Kagan. You probably know him better as NBA University on Twitter. He's also a writing contributor for OrlandoMagicDaily.com. We're really excited to pick his brain. We've been trying to make this happen for quite a while. Stephen, how are you, man? Thanks for joining the show. Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you fellas. Uh, big fan. So this is a, really a dream come true for a Magic fan. Oh, man. Oh, boy. I don't know about all that. We really appreciate that. <laughs> Before we start a recording, you know, I'm not really close to Orlando. Steven is actually reporting live from Dallas right now. Steven and I realized that we grew up like 20 minutes away from each other. So, small world. Pretty, and have pretty mutual cool. friends. So and have mutual uh, friends. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it, it is pretty crazy. The good yeah. old uh, 727. <laughs> well, I don't yeah, know. Well, pretty up much by you, it's the 352. 352. Oh, yeah, yes, it's the 352 up by you. Uh, and, oh, look at Luke throwing up the 352. <laughs> Anyways, we're here to talk Orlando Magic basketball. Super excited to have you. Thank you for taking the time. Paolo Bancaro, the number one pick in the draft. Um, you know, anyone that's been following your work for quite some time, you put out a really impressive article just kind of outlining Paolo's offensive game. But what did you think of Paolo from Summer League? Um, great question. I mean, Paolo, you can't really start anywhere else. Um, I just thought he looked exactly how I was hoping he looked in a more NBA centric context, as opposed to, um, on a court in at Duke where it was just cramped, um, and filled with outside of AJ Griffin, just a whole bunch of guys who can't shoot. Um, so it was really exciting to be able to take all of those projections and all of those thoughts about um, how his passing would look and how incredible he would look in transition um, and be able to just see it play out live, man. I mean, he's obviously brilliant. Um, it's You have to remind yourself how big he is because of how well he moves, like how he dribbles and, and how he looks out there, the wiggle that he has. It's just, it's really easy to forget he is the same height and weight as Dwight Howard. It's just, it's... It's really, it's shocking. Um, So it was really cool to see the physical traits translate. It was great to see the ball handling and the passing. Um, And then obviously, I mean, some of the shot making, that's the stuff that I think will take a little bit of time. Um, But he has the mentality uh, and he has the mechanics and it looks like something that is going to translate long term. Um, He had a beautiful shot chart in college where he just hit every single spot, uh, was, was filled um, and that's going to be something that serves him really well. And it was something we already got to see in summer league. And I'm just excited to see it project into NBA regular season. Were you, uh, for those who might not have maybe been familiar with their work, maybe towards your leanings prior to draft was, was Paolo your guy? Were you higher on him than others? Was it kind of, did you, did you prefer a different guy? I know Jonathan and I kind of, the, the preference was Jabari, but we said we'd be okay with any And we were three. wrong. Let's just like, let's put that out there. We were wrong. That's it, okay. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but Steven, wrong. where did Great. you fall? Um, so uh, independent of knowing the Magic were going to be the number one overall pick, um, I had Chet number one and Paolo number two on their own tier. Um, and then mm-hmm. I had uh, Jabari and I had Keegan Murray um, by themselves on tier two. So I was definitely, I definitely loved Chet. I was very, I'm very, I still am very intrigued with the idea of who he can be as a player. Um, I'm also just a sucker for defense um, and rim protection uh, as like a, an efficiency, just as a guy who, who leans slightly analytic. Um, he just put up insane efficiency number. So I had him one, but I had Paolo right there. And then with the magic context, I was, it was weird because as soon as the, the ping pong balls fell, they were like, all right, Paolo, number three, like it's a two man choice between Chet and Jabari. So I was kind of just like, all right, well, I got to get full on team Chet. Like I'm not a, that much of a believer in Jabari's ceiling. Like, so I kind of just didn't even think about Paolo, but if asked like in a vacuum, I would lean Chet, but for the magic, I think Paolo makes all the sense in the world. I think that was, especially in the hindsight of like summer league, I think that's just the right choice. It's who we need. Yeah. And I think like looking back, I really was, uh, I I said this recently and uh, maybe we were overcomplicating the pick, yeah. right? Like maybe, maybe that was the case because Paolo very much like NBA ready body, mm-hmm. um, you know, wasn't shy about, you know, taking a shot you know, yes, he struggled from the perimeter, but kind of, you know, you you just think like maybe in a few years' time he figures it out. Like he said, his mechanics mm-hmm. are good. Like looking back, maybe I think the only thing I would tell myself is like, don't overcomplicate things. Mm-hmm. Like he is he is very talented, but it all kind of does come down to the fact that like any of the three 
We were just like, yeah, okay. Like, I still right. could see a path where Jabari is good. Summer League doesn't sure, at all rule absolutely. him out. Um, and, and and Paolo, I am glad that he'll be able to take full advantage of the NBA game mm-hmm. being just more spread out, um, even in, like, five-out scenarios, too, with, you know, just, like, the, the spacing that maybe, you know, the bigs in Orlando can provide. Right. Whereas, like you said, in, in college, it is very crammed. Same reservations that you had maybe about, like, Chet, right like mm-hmm. chet in terms of just transition reliant maybe and and then in the you know nba game it slows up quite a bit right. like there's always that that's the most interesting part to me about the college to nba game and mm-hmm. that whole process of like who do you like is because at the end of the day like you really don't know how it's going to translate yeah there are so many variables and differences and there's that's the reason that people can't some people absolutely hate college basketball <laughs> yeah. and while they love the nba like yeah. there are vast differences so just having to like put these young players into the nba it's hard to know like who who's going to come out on top yeah that's a great point you make about overcomplicating things this is something i kind of touched on i just released a an ar- article on orlando magic daily about franz and his like potential all-star ceiling and what that can look like um and it was something that i related to him and as well as palo of this phenomena we have of associating guys who are advanced in their games with having a lower ceiling. I think it's a strange, um, just like player, um, just like scouting that people do where it's like, Oh, this guy's already good at all of these things. Then I have a harder time projecting what that can look like. Instead of with Jabari, you can just say, well, man, if he gets a handle, like then he's going to be X, Y, Z, but it's like, okay, well, while Jabari's working on getting the basics of his handle, like Palo already has one, like now he could start incorporating moves and, and being able to pass off the dribble and being able to like, not just attack closeouts, but actually self-create. And those are, it's a, it's an interesting distinction, but it's tough, man. I mean, scouting, scouting is a tough thing. <laughs> College basketball is, is most definitely a slog to watch sometimes. Yeah, I mean, if it was easy, you know, the the best player in these drafts would go number one every year, right. and we know that's not the case, right? We want to talk a little bit about uh, Caleb Houston, you know, the mm. number thirty two pick in the draft. What were your thoughts on Caleb, kind of kind of pre draft, and then uh, did summer league influence or, or change any of that for you? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question as well. I I liked Houston. I liked him as like pretty much right where he went in like a late first round, early second round kind of context. Um, it's always tough with those guys who are coming from pedigree where it's like, all right, top five, top 10 guy in their class. You don't know if they're going to buy into their role. Um, And we saw him kind of wrestling with that role in college some um, where it was like, okay, he's coming in. He's supposed to be a top freshman. um, But what he's best at is playing off ball and just coming off screens and shooting and filling gaps and lanes in transition and knocking down shots and kind of being as versatile as he can on the defensive end. Um, and we saw him sort of fighting through that and we saw him with some shooting struggles in college. I mean, that's really, that's really the, the end all be all. If he was shooting the way he shot in summer league or the way he shot in high school and college, he would have been picked in probably the late lottery. Um, so it was cool to just kind of see him come out in that Rockets game, especially, and just like start drilling threes. He got super hot in the second half. Um, but I just like the way he played, man. Like he, you can tell he has good people around him who are telling him like, listen, this is your path. This is your path to getting minutes. And that path is being Cam Johnson. Like that path is going out there and knowing where your spots are um, and getting offensive rebounds and busting your butt in transition and just letting it fly. Um, and that we, we don't really have anyone who can really let it fly other than maybe T. Ross. And uh, he seemed maybe mildly checked out uh last season it might even be more so this season. that's fair so, <laughs> yeah i would say dabbling and being checked out so it'll be cool to just see if he can kind of fill in that role but i see him as there's a very clear path for a high-end role player um as long as he's buying into that and he looked like he he looked like he was so that's an exciting like super high valuable pick at that spot there, there was a possession in one of the later uh, summer league games where he was just making like cut after cut to the rim and, yeah. and perfectly timed, wide open cuts, didn't get the ball, then kind of released to the corner, was wide open again, never saw the ball there. So I feel like Caleb is the classic case of a guy who once he's surrounded by better players and especially better mm-hmm. playmakers and guys that have a little bit more vision and can make mm-hmm. those advanced reads, he's going to look much better with the Magic uh, we're kind of talking about this now, but what is the lineup going to look like for the Magic next season? How much 
you know, time is he mm. going to see on the floor realistically? But uh, Caleb Houston, really, really interesting. So we've di- you know dove into the magic stuff a little bit, but we want to talk some more about Steven. So apart from you know <laughs> representing Pasco, you know over here. Well, you're Hernando. I'm sorry, Hernando, you're like yes, right please. across. You're right across the Pasco, Hernando. Well, <laughs> yeah, forget this guy. What is this guy doing on, on our on our podcast here, Luke? No, <laughs> I, I'm totally kidding. But that kind of West. Central Florida that we're, we're mm-hmm. talking about here. Um, w- w- tell us a little bit about your background, like kind of what you what got you into basketball, and especially you're really diving kind of into like the analytics side of, of the game. Yeah, so I uh, just grew up in a family that played basketball. Uh, my brother and sisters all played high school ball. My sister played college ball um, at Southeastern in Lakeland. Um, so I just kind of grew, grew up around the game and then I played as well. Um, played growing up, played in high school. Uh, unfortunately I never progressed to, uh, any level beyond <laughs> high school, uh, some physical limitations. Hey, join there. join the there. club. <laughs> yeah. Every other person <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, but that was just really, I had a passion for it. I did a lot of coaching. Um, I caught, I taught or taught coached, um, middle school boys and coached high school girls, um, at Springstead and, uh, at Explorer in Spring Hill, Florida. So I did that. And then I went to University of Florida, um, studied Go Gators, there. Baby. Go Gators. I uh, got my Kevin's going to hate this degree. episode. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> See an FSU Kevin's guy? Kevin's a, a big FSU guy, yeah. Ah, uh, man. Yeah, I'm glad he's not here. So... Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, me too. Hey, yeah. hey both we all have relax. that in common. <laughs> there will be no Kevin Tucker, producer Kevin Slander no on this slander. podcast, everybody. Uh, it's funny. But yeah, so I went to University of Florida and then, um, yeah, just love basketball. Like that's really that. And uh, right now I'm in seminary. I'm getting my master's of divinity. Um, so it's essentially like theological studies. Um, so those are really my, my main passions. Um, and I've always talked about it and been listening to podcasts and reading articles and being like, I feel like I could do that. And then I kind of just never did it uh, and just hung around. And then I got married um, in 2020. 2020. Mm. <laughs> One. Nice. Oh, you want to fact? Do we need to fact check? <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully her AirPods are on uh, noise yeah, canceling out there. Hopefully she doesn't not listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Our don't wives don't listen will. to this, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? I think we're good. Yeah. So got married and then moved out to Dallas. So that's been really cool so far. And then in April of this year, um, I was pretty bored and I was like, you know, it feels a little weird to be tweeting things from my personal page. So I'm just going to make an NBA Twitter and then all of a sudden, man, it just kind of just kind of went from there. As far as the like analytical slant, I think there's just always been an interest in just like the the philosophy of basketball, and I think with the philosophy comes uh, a lot of understanding of what the analytics are saying. Um, so I'm not necessarily like algorithm guy, where I'm just like making math problems to try to uh, <laughs> make basketball as objective as possible. But what I love to do is take data and then interpret it. Um, through a lens of like understanding the game really well um, and then being able to like articulate articulate that to people um, in a way that's just really simple to digest and like I really enjoy doing that that's like a big passion of mine with basketball like looking at just like a data set and being like all right what can I take from this where's the noise coming from um, what context uh, can I add to this to make it make more sense um, and being able to just do that and then create some content and share it with people has been like a a huge blessing for me. It's been a really, really cool three months. Uh, hit my 10,000, uh, follower mark today. That was my, that was my big one. Yep. I got taken out to barbecue for that. That was our, uh, that was our agreement. Once I got to 10 K, I got some barbecues. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a really <laughs> didn't cool. Eat, didn't eat barbecue since April. <laughs> yeah, just so yeah. you could have. Yeah, I've been 10K. hanging on just so I could cherish the 10 K. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, that's no, where I, I'm at. I think- yeah, and I think that's interesting, Stephen. Like, as far as the analytical side goes, I think that it's never you know people people see analytics and they're like, it just comes at least to me, like from my viewpoint, how it can sa- seem is like, wow, that person is like so much more intelligent than me, and I'm not. <laughs> that's calling usually you the un- case. Well, I'm not calling you unintelligent here with my point, Stephen, but you know what to look for, like you know. That you, like it's not no, so much as that as it is like you go in and you're like I know exactly what I need to look for here, um, and then kind of where the intelligence comes in is like providing context for those numbers, right? And knowing mm-hmm. and having the the IQ to look and become just more familiar. Like it's a whole other universe mm-hmm. because there are people who are just so removed from analytics, whether it be <laughs> right. basketball fans, 
or staff. There are staff right. that like if people know the insiders, like I've heard it multiple times about different like college basketball programs, like, oh man, well, you know, they're not very analytic heavy. Right. And it's like, well, they, they should be, right? Or there there needs to be a balance. So I, I think that like that's kind of the observation that I make about it, is that like where where did you start to really dive into analytics though that because that's what i'm interested in Mm -hmm. at what point did basketball go from x's and o's and just like surface level things to i want to get deeper and like to the point did you just see that there was a need for it um or that you just were genuinely interested in it and kind of kept to yourself for a while yeah about it it. it's definitely the latter as far as like that's just how i enjoyed interpreting the game um, on my own time, along with like understanding the X's and O's. Um, and I've always, what you were saying, I think is interesting and, and instructive as far as there seems to just be two sides. Like it's like a binary. All right. I'm either I test like bag Twitter, uh, like don't talk to me about mm-hmm. the Vorps and Schmorps and, and Borps, you know, side yeah. of Twitter. <laughs> and then there's the like complete, have you watched basketball or are you just a machine uh, type of <laughs> type of people where you're just like, dude, can you like say that in English? Um, so I, I just what I saw was a need for someone who could like look at these and understand what they mean and interpret them, but also not be a gatekeeper and just be like, hey, look at this really fuzzy graph that's like absolutely impossible to understand. Um, and if you don't understand it, you don't know basketball, but also not being someone who uh, just ignores the wealth of information that's out there. Because ultimately, right, I can't watch every single game, every single player, every single possession, but like the computer can, where there's mm-hmm. going to there's gonna be a disconnect, right? There's, it's not always going to be perfect, but ultimately you need to recognize that like, okay, these couple of flashes that I saw while I was watching, you know, Orlando versus Atlanta in, in March, um, those might not be as as indicative of what a player's performance is as the analytical output of of a computer that has watched every single possession and has been perfectly tailored to to interpret it in certain ways. So I want to be able to take that and not ignore that information, but just make it accessible, make it something that is actually fun to talk about instead of it just being like, no, you're wrong. This is objective. This is the only way to look at it. Like, that's not how I operate. I want conversation, but I want intelligent conversation. So that's where I'm at. Well, we brought you here for conversation. When you include Luke and I, I don't know how much of an intelligent conversation that it's going to be, but we like to think that it's at least going to be entertaining. Uh, You know, you talk about the fact that you have kind of a slant toward analytics, but you also have a slant towards the Orlando Magic, and that's why we wanted to bring you on, one of the the many reasons here. And uh, talking about bringing you on, one of the things that I mentioned is we know that you like to find these little nuggets, you know, in the numbers. Um, So I want to ask you, what are some of the more interesting things that you found diving into the numbers about the magic Ooh, let me count the ways it's all i do i sit around and, and think about magic uh numbers <laughs> uh, i love it <laughs> yeah well this is we'll start with something just very simple and also very sad which is that the orlando magic have been bottom 10 in offensive rating every single year since the dwight trade um every single season so we're 10 for 10 checks out uh, which honestly impressive right only team in the league to do that <laughs> And we're dead last in aggregate oh. in offensive rating th- since then. So um, that's been uh, that's been one thing that I came across that I was like, you know what, Paolo was quite certainly the right choice at yeah. the top of the draft. We need someone who can please <laughs> <Anybody>. <laughs> please do something. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sick and tired of people not getting to the free throw line and watching 500 dribble handoffs between Evan Fournier and Nikola Vucevic. <laughs> it's just it's just time. Mm for someone who can create for themselves. So that was one where I just was like, wow, it definitely checks out, but it was also shocking that we were the only team (laughs) that's done that. So that was definitely one. Um, And then this is my love child is Franz Wagner. It's, it's just, I can't uh, get enough of this guy and his tape and his analytics. But one thing I came across that I thought was particularly special, I mentioned it in my article, but last year defensively, um, B-Ball Index, which is a, a source I use a lot. I think they do a really good job. You should check them out. Uh, they ranked him in the 94th percentile in defensive versatility last year. Um, and so they do a thing where they track what positions uh, he was guarding last mm. season. So uh, he guarded a point guards 15.5% of the time, which is pretty high. Uh, shooting guards 241 Small forwards 278 
power forwards, 25.3, and centers, 7.4 at the time. So he is just like, when people say, oh, this guy can guard one through five or one through four, like it's usually particularly overblown. But like Franz last year was legitimately doing that and doing it pretty well. Like his defensive metrics actually graded out super well for a rookie. So it was, I thought that was a really interesting thing. Is that something that you guys uh, picked up on throughout the season, seeing his versatility? Uh, I didn't know that it was legitimately one through five. I felt like it was more like two through four, but I think the mm-hmm. numbers that you just mentioned kind of lend themselves to thinking that he can step out guard point guards if he needs to, if he needs to get down there and guard the five. I think you said it was like 7%. No, so not a ton, mm-hmm. but still the ability to do that you know, on certain matchups is, is always going to lend itself to his versatility. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to ask you about that um, I've actually referenced you on this podcast a couple of times is Wendell Carter, not necessarily mm. being the the biggest shot blocker but still being a good tool in terms of rim protection because of his deterrence mm-hmm. at the rim can you talk about that a little bit yeah absolutely so he um grades out really really nicely as a rim protector he has he's in the 94th percentile of defense field goal percentage against at the rim which is i would argue the most valuable and like actually like applicable defensive metric there is i think that's also a a big reason why our rim protection metrics are much better than our perimeter defensive metrics so i think that's a big reason why all the analytical models spit out big men as being so important which obviously you know rim protection is important to defense regardless because it's the most high efficiency shot but i think that's another reason where it's like they're weighted that way because it's, it's something that really makes sense so he um, people are shooting like 11% less than what their expected percentage would be at the rim against Wendell Carter based on uh, where they're taking the shot, what kind of shot it is, um, and who the offensive player is. Um, so he's he's really, yeah, unbelievable in that way. He's positionally really strong. Um, when you look at his uh, matchup difficulty ratings, they were way higher than Mo Bamba's last year. So he was doing a lot more work than Mo, which is not on... Yeah, I test <laughs> Kind of goes without saying. <laughs> yeah, kind of goes without saying. But like he was doing all the dirty work and protecting the rim, which just frees up everybody to do everything else. So he was, yeah, he was really awesome in that way. And then even offensively, um, number one in the league in points per possession on putback. Um, so he was the best uh, at grabbing an offensive rebound and uh, putting it back in. He had 1.5 points per possession on those plays, which is like better than free throws. Um, so that's really, really incredible. And he was also 84th percentile in isolation, which I thought was particularly interesting. Um, he's really becoming like last year, he was becoming really nice off of just like two dribbles. Um, people were starting to respect his above the break three. And he was able to just like blow by guys and like had some like pretty nasty dunks and like nice little yeah. finishes and some and ones and like to see he's in the 84th percentile like that's he's obviously in a little less volume but he's standing like shoulder to shoulder with some like really legitimate um scorers so it's it's really cool to see that i would love to watch him expand that game this year especially with palo hitting him on beautiful passes defenses are going to be in rotation and he's going to be able to attack that way um and then hit some once the help comes hit some really nice interior passes as well to a cutting front so that is that is my dream (laughs) that's what i see when i close my eyes at night so you did a poll today uh or yesterday sorry so you did a poll yesterday Mm -hmm. where you just you know said who's orlando's best player next season Mm -hmm. and the 41 percent of the vote went to paolo and 32 percent of it went to franz wagner 19 percent to wendell and eight percent to markel fultz Mm -hmm. my question to you is you're obviously very involved in the analytical side of things does do you have like uh first of all i I do want to know who you think matt the magic's best player will be next season but also um do you have like a favorite and like analytical player versus like favorite player on the magic like or like Ooh. who's better like does there is there kind of like a, a disconnect i guess like where you're like okay like analytically did like you said franz right mm-hmm. in that way as like you you love him analytically and how he grades out now is that different from like who you pref- like is your favorite player to watch on the magic what, what's kind of the the difference there mm, that's a good question i'll start with the the first one of who i think will be the best that's a really tough one. I don't think it'll be Paolo next season. That would be pretty surprising. It's just mm. tough for rookies to be the best player on a team, <laughs> frankly. I mean, uh, as simple as that, it's pretty tricky. Um, he could be our leading scorer, um, but I do think – I think it's between 
Franz and Wendell. Um, I think next year might end up being Wendell Carter just based on Mm -hmm. him needing less touches than Franz does uh, to be able to, to impact things, which obviously Franz has a huge impact, uh, off the ball and doing all those things. But I think he's at his best and shown he was at his best when he was, uh, able to like make his own offense, um, and was kind of given the reins a little bit. And I, I fear that that will be, uh, drawn back some this year with, with Fultz and, uh, having a healthy season and obviously the presence of Palo. So I think Wendell could really be the guy who's just like anchoring our defense and making great passes and being the benefactor of all of these great, playmakers around him and can actually like up his scoring total a decent amount just getting all of his like the things we just talked about mm-hmm. um so i would maybe lean that way but i could be talked into franz he's my guy um to answer your other question i think a lot of a lot of my i was very happy with myself a lot of my opinions <laughs> of the magic i feel mm-hmm. like were pretty like in line um with how guys graded out for the most part one thing that i think was surprising was mo bamba's defense grading out well um and I, I think that is, again, like pretty akin to the role that he was allowed to play. Um, he was freed up like no other seven footer except for, I don't know, maybe a little bit of Mobley last year with Jared Allen. Like very few guys that are that big are have the luxury of having someone next to them who's actually doing all the hard work for them. So they can just right. do some mm. do some like help side blocks um, and some like late peel back blocks and just like kind of just do their thing and not have a ton of responsibility. So his like um, rim protection numbers graded out pretty well. Um, And I would say that's something that differs from my eye, which like he has the ability somewhat, but I just, I'm just not a huge mo. How does his matchup difficulty grade out? You know, you say when Dell grades really high there and he's Mm -hmm. doing most of the work, where does Mo rank? Do you have those numbers in front of you? I don't on me, but I know it was low. I think it was in like the 30th percentile. High test confirms. In that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's always yeah. good. And I have these conversations with my buddies, you know, they know I'm big into to the magic and they'll, they'll just send me random, you know, memes of, oh, look at these stats. And I'm like, yeah, but that, there's no context around <laughs> right. that. And like you said, that's so, so important. My, I, I don't want to say my love child, but somebody that I'm very high on and I still see a lot of potential in is Jalen Suggs. We don't have to get into offense. Everyone knows. I think we would all agree <laughs> yeah, well. that the offense was not where it, it wants to be. But um, anything that you came across, like defensively, obviously we, we know that he was incredible on that end last year. Mm-hmm. But was there anything that you were surprised about with Jalen's defense? Um, well, point blank, he was the best rookie uh, defensive point of attack defender. Uh, Herb is the only one. Well, Herb and um, Mobley. But as far as like Herb for the wings, Mobley for the bigs. And it's it sucks for the guards um like no no argument the only closer per, like only person that's even in the conversation is uh IO from Chicago um but yeah Suggs is he's excellent man i mean he he's his physicality i think is something that is absolutely impossible for a rookie to be able to to do and like they mentioned on 99 percent of broadcasts that he used to play football but like there is a certain element of like he has that like that that kid in pe who played football and they would come and play basketball with other guys just foul like, everybody dude, like dude relax yeah like you, yeah like you're hurt you're kind of hurting me like please and like he had that but it was it was still in like a relatively controlled manner like i think he's just he's so strong for his age. Um, and he has like short area burst where he's able to keep the ball in front, um, in a way that is, is crazy for rookies. Like rookie point of attack defenders are awful, like pretty, almost always they're negative. And he graded out positive in pretty much every, um, all in one defensive metric. Um, and really high towards the top of the league. He was also in the 90 something percentile in matchup difficulty. So he was like, he was on the hardest possible high usage score every night. Um, and he was doing an excellent job. I'm, I'm very, very high on, like very high on his defensive ceiling. The only thing that is a li- maybe slightly lacking, which is, this is actually similar with Franz is like the defensive playmaking is fine. I would say it's not it's it doesn't grade out as elite where um, he's just like forcing a ton of deflections and steals and kind of like doing it that way. Um, But he's just so solid. Like guys just don't shoot well against him. And I think that's I mean, obviously, that's that's incredibly valuable moving forward. I mean, we talk about and it's very much like the narrative around Jalen that even as a rookie, he was one of the best perimeter defenders in the league. Does that grade out as well? Like not just in terms of rookies, just like the entire NBA. Uh, Yeah. 
it's it's he's I wouldn't say like he was flirting with all defense or anything yet. Um, oh right, but but he was he was yeah he's definitely up there. He was really really solid. Yeah, I, average, I think it's safe sure. to say like top ten, fifteen like perimeter defenders in the league last year as a guard. Yeah, probably in that range. Yeah, fifteen twenty. Yeah. I would say right in that. Okay. in that realm, That's which fair. is crazy for like rookies. It's crazy for a rookie. Like, it's insane. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's un- yeah, yeah, it's crazy. He's got if some we like just get Drew him knock down some potential. threes. We'll really God have something us. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if he could dribble, <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about a guy that is special and uh, pretty much all of Magic fans' hearts, and it's the guy's jersey I'm wearing right now, which is uh, Markel Fultz. Um, is the jersey I am wearing right now for those of you that aren't watching on YouTube. Do you have anything? Because I just, (laughs) in terms of analytics, because, Stephen, I am so tired of hearing national media talk about the Magic, or just not even national media, basketball fans that aren't Mm -hmm. Magic fans. They talk about the Magic, and they never mention Markel Fultz. That's true. And I understand he played 18 games last year, but he still had... Uh, an impact the magic i think we're six and 12 with him in terms of win loss mm-hmm. record last year and he was only playing 20 minutes a game is what he right. ended up averaging there i just feel like there has to be numbers out there that at least provide some value to what markel fultz was to this team and maybe it is all surface level maybe it is the fact that the magic were significantly better with him on the floor mm-hmm. in terms of their record right but there i just is, is there anything um, there is definitely, uh, there is uh, anything, as David Steele would say. So, um, <laughs> I am very excited about Mark Fultz as well. I'm going to sound like, I mean, this is an Orlando Magic podcast, but I am going to sound hey, like such an you absolute don't, homer. It, it, that's what we're here for. That's what the people <laughs> yeah. listening to this want. We are Do pushing not worry. agendas. Yeah, that is we a are fact. Pushing Propaganda, agendas. yes. <laughs> and I could say it with... So much sincerity because all my friends have known that I've just been the biggest magic like hater for the last 10 years as far as like where we've been. So this is the most like genuinely excited I've been for a long time. But okay. So this is a big one for me. Um, he finished second in the entire NBA among qualifying players um, in high value assists per 36. So obviously we're going to have to do per 36 stuff with Markel because he played right. a very, you know, minutes limit. Um, but he was he was number two. Um, behind only Trey Young. And high-value assists are essentially assists. Um, they're like the anti-Westbrook, where it's not you're holding on to it till there's two seconds left on the shot clock, and then you deal it off, and then you hope somebody hits it and you get an assist. It is assists that result in free throws, um, open layups and dunks, and open three-pointers. Um, so it filters out all the other assists that you get. Um, and he was second in the entire league. He put up 10.1 high-value assists um, per 75, which is like elite-level playmaking. I mean, the other guys the other guys that were around him on this list, so it's Trey Young 1, him 2, Tyrese Halliburton 3, Luka Doncic 4, LaMelo Ball 5, Darius Garland 6. So it's just like... Every really, really great point guard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like every great point guard and then Markel Fultz, which is is a pretty exciting thing. And it, it matches, right? You watch him and he is just in the paint any time that he wants. Um, and it, he can't shoot, which is crazy. I mean, he could shoot mid-range a little bit, but it's like it's crazy that guys are sagging off him. And when he decides he wants to get in there, he just can't. Um, he has that like Shea Gilgis Alexander y kind of vibe where it's like you don't really know how he got there. He just is there making a sick interior pass mm-hmm. or like a nice little up and under layup. And you're just like, man, like every time I watch this guy, he, he is doing something really spectacular and like showing, right, why he was why he was considered a number one overall pick talent. Like he has something really, really special there. Um, so that's what I'm that's what I'm most excited about to watch him alongside a bunch of other really smart guys and really great interior passers who can just like like create a whole bunch of high value assists for one another all season. And that number might be even a little bit higher if guys were actually knocking down the open threes <laughs> That's you know, true. That he, he was finding yeah. them for. So, I mean, I'd like to see what the uh, potential high value assists look like. You know what I mean? So, um, but <laughs> yeah. Steven, this was a lot of fun, man. Uh, you're incredibly knowledgeable and intelligent. You bra- bring great insight. We really appreciate you joining the show. This was a ton of fun. Can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and find your work? Yeah, absolutely. So you're just going to find me on Twitter at NBA University. Um, and then you're going to find me on Orlando Magic Daily. Um, if I ever post an article or if I ever submit an article, I'm going to just post it straight on my Twitter. So just keep an eye on that. And that's that's all I got going on right now. 
Awesome, Steve. Well, I want to, I want to, I want to add one oh, more. Oh, go thing ahead. Yeah. Then. Okay. So I, I have one more burning question. You put out <laughs> a thank you post, pretty much for after 96 days. You know, you you hit 10k followers, which absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I you high added efficiency. A, a very yeah yeah high efficiency for sure that grades out well. <laughs> yeah, it's no, high your efficiency you, followers. your re- your reply to your own tweet was a, a very essential note that I held near and dear to my heart as I yeah. read this. You said, "P.S." Orlando is making the play in. Oh yeah. So I I want to I want to know. Obviously, there's probably some bias there, but you did say like you've been a notable kind of just like hating on where the team was at the last decade, mm-hmm. and now you're like the genuinely the most excited that you've ever been. Do you think that the Magic are able to make the play in this season genuinely? Uh, point blank, I I do. Yeah, I think that okay. the defensive improvement we showed. Uh, after yeah. the All-Star break last year, I think getting a healthy Jonathan Isaac, fingers crossed, year two of our rookies, Paolo's going to help a lot, and a full season of health, healthy Marco Fultz. Like, I think that that's a team that flirts with, with the plan, no doubt. Amen. Sweet. Yes, that's and all amen. I, need it. I, I love it. Know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Hallelujah. Steven, man. Thank you so much for joining the show. This was a ton of fun. We'll definitely have to do this again in the regular season for sure. Absolutely. Check back in. I appreciate you guys so much, man. Y'all are the best. Luke, that was our interview with Stephen Kagan. Again, we had a blast with Stephen. Thank you so much again for taking the time out and coming on the show. It was a ton of fun. Super insightful. Yeah, man. It was good. I was happy he was able to give us something on Markel Fultz, speak to really just his impact uh, on the game and on the team. Uh, you know, obviously had that minute restriction, which we you know dove into a little bit and talked about with Stephen. But yeah, uh, Thanks to Steven for for coming on. Um, we want to have him as a guest once again, obviously soon, like you said, regular season. I want to add a note, Jonathan, uh, unrelated to to Steven and, and NBA University, and and this is something I didn't. I I just thought of that thought of it, which is why I didn't you know run a buy or tell you about it. But Perfect. I think for those of you that are are watching this or you know listen to us audio wise on audio platforms and you want are able to dm us on whatever platform you want of ours feel free we we obviously we have this off season ahead of us we have a lot of fun stuff planned for you guys but there we're not going to act like there's not you know 20 episodes or whatever it is left that that we're that we're filling like i said have a lot of fun stuff planned but if you guys have a guest in mind for us, drop it in the YouTube comments below. Uh, DM us anywhere if you are listening on audio. If you especially like a guest that you've enjoyed us having in the past and you want us to just have them on again before the season starts, um, would love for you guys to do that. And we have a running list of guests and we will just add it to the to the list and continue on. But I just wanted to, to put that in there, Jonathan. I think it'd be good just to kind of get a gauge of who the, the listeners want to see us talk to. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The last thing I want to touch on before we go ahead and sign off here for this episode is if you guys missed out on like the draft lottery party or you missed out on the draft party, you know, come in and just kind of hanging out with us. Uh, we're going to be looking to put together a, a pretty sizable group to attend like one of the last preseason games. The Magic have two preseason games coming up before the regular season starts. Uh, we're looking at that preseason game um, uh, against the Cavaliers. I want to say looking at the schedule, I believe that's October. October 14th, I think is what we're looking at. So just trying to gauge interest, see how many people are, are, are going to be into that. I think we're probably going to end up doing that. Um, so if you're interested, just kind of watch our socials, you know, listen to the show, keep your eyes and ears open for, for details to follow on that. We're probably going to get like a link from the magic to where everyone can just kind of go and purchase their own ticket to make it easy and convenient for everyone. We'll definitely do something before the game somewhere downtown Orlando Everyone walk over to Amway together, make a ton of noise, get everybody hyped up about the preseason game. And one of the good things is usually those last couple preseason games are really like regular season dress rehearsals. Yeah. So we'll most likely be able to see like a lot of Paolo, Marco Fultz, hopefully yeah. Jonathan Isaac, Wendell, a lot of Franz Wagner. So it'll be like a perfect preseason game to go to. So going to be super excited for that. Uh, before we go ahead and sign off, Luke, anything else? No, no, that's uh, that's about it for me. All right, let's wrap it up. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You guys are listening to The Sixth Man Show. We will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. 
We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!